However, the evidence wasn't good enough. And the biggest thing that he had a problem with is that he couldn't actually say how it worked. That was one of the big problems that he had. So nobody was willing to go out and talk about continental drift simply because nobody knew how it even worked. Even though it was good evidence, they weren't willing to really go out and tell the world about this stuff without any kind of uh, description of how it works. So. <clears throat> What happened is later on, this happened about 1926 when Wegener was around and he was rejected. Then something else happened in the 40s. Do you know, remember what happened in the 40s? World War II took place. Remember the big war, Hitler, everything? Hey, it was not a very good time to be traveling around the globe, especially if you were on a ship. So. England and Germany were not doing very well. They were quite bitter enemies. And England, if you know anything about England, England is an island. And Hitler came up with this little idea called the U-boat. And the U-boat is basically just a submarine. And he had submarines placed all around the island. So anybody that was trying to get into England or out were not capable of doing it. And he didn't care who it was or what it was whether it was the Red Cross, whether it was a cruise ship, it didn't matter. They were not going to get into England. Even though he wasn't supposed to, he did it anyway. And he started bombing these ships. Well, then, of course, Pearl Harbor happened, and the United States started getting involved in it. And they became allies with England. But how do you fight an enemy that you can't see? Especially when you live on one side of the world, and it takes ships to get from one place to the other. I mean, we know now that he had submarines here along the coast of New York. And it's possible that he may have even had them down even by the Mississippi River where the water flows out into the Gulf. Um, we really don't know where he had all of his stuff because they were basically invisible. So there was this new little tiny device that was used. It was called sonar. And they started putting sonar on these ships. And what it was, it was just an instrument that would send out a little tiny ping and that sound wave would travel down through the water, hit down the bottom of the ocean, and bounce back up, or bounce off whatever it hit, and it would create an image on the ship. So they were able to see the bottom of the ocean, they were able to see whales, and they were also able to see submarines. And so they started using sonar, and things started to change a little bit because we were able to take out some of these subs. And the game kind of changed a little bit. Well, there was a man by the name of Harry Hess, who was an admiral. And Harry Hess, he was actually a rear admiral, but he was also a scientist. And while he was on these ships, he had this idea that, hey, let's use these, and maybe we can scan the bottom of the ocean and take pictures of the bottom of the ocean. He had realized wherever they went in the ocean, they had to have the sonar on, because they had no idea where or when they would run into any of these subs. So they started scanning the bottom of the ocean. Now before that, they used to think the bottom of the ocean looked like the bottom of the bathtub. They thought it was totally flat. There was nothing else down there. It was totally a void of life, everything. All it was was a nice big flat bottom. However, when he started looking at all this information, the picture totally changed. He started to realize that the bottom of the ocean was not flat at all, but it looked just like it does outside. If you go outside, you've got the mountains, you've got valleys, you've got all that stuff, get rid of the air and change it with water. That's what the bottom of the ocean looks like. It looks just like it does here on the land, except instead of air, it's water. So we found out that as we went through the bottom of the ocean, there were these deep trenches that were down the bottom of the ocean, and there were these what we call table mounts, and this humongous mountain range that went right down through the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, way different than what we thought. Um, that's up to you. Totally different than, than what we thought. 
Well, after the war, they started looking at this and started looking at it closer because they thought, hey, wow, this is totally different than what we thought. Uh, it's not flat. It actually has a really pretty great topography. Um, mountains, long mountains. The longest mountain chain in the world is here. It's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It goes all the way from the North Pole to the South Pole. It covers the entire globe. So this was kind of exciting. So after Harry Hess, he discovered this, other scientists started doing some research on it as well. Now I'm going to draw another picture here. Kind of give you an idea. We'll draw a bigger picture, and I'm going to show you some evidences that they found as they were starting to uh, search the bottom of the ocean. So if we go to the Atlantic Ocean, we know that there is this humongous mountain range. And these scientists started searching the bottom of the ocean. So after Harry Hess, one of the things they started to do is they actually went out and took these ships and they started drilling to the bottom of the ocean. They went along here and they drilled a hole here and here all the way across the ocean. And they took core samples. They took samples of the rock. They wanted to see what the rock was like, what in the world is going on down there. Is it anything different than what's up on top of the surface? And they found out it is. It's different. It's mostly made up of metals. Uh, whereas the crust up here, the land is mostly made up of silica, which is more glass, like sand. This is more made up of heavy metals. Well, not really heavy metals, but more like uh, iron and magnesium. But they found out something else here, too. They started taking the age of the rock here. And they found out that right here, the rock here, was really old, super old. But right over here, the rock was really young. And over here, the rock was really old. I thought, wow, that's really weird. Why in the world would it be old, it gets younger, and then it gets old again? It was kind of strange. The other thing that they did is they took sediment thickness samples. So as they're sitting here looking at the ocean, they are assuming that everything falls down to the bottom of the ocean at a constant rate. That means silt, sand, sediment, animals, whatever that dies goes down to the bottom of the ocean. And if it falls at a constant rate, then the thickness of the sediment here should all be pretty much exactly the same thickness. But it wasn't. What they found out was that the sediment here was actually really thin, and then it got really thick. And the same was true for the opposite side. So the sediment here was thick, and the sediment here was thin, and the sediment here was thick. I was thinking that, wow, this is really kind of strange. Why would it be young and the sediment be thin when it should all be the same thickness? Why is it old here, but the sediment is thick here when it should all be the same? And the same is true for over here. They did one more sample. They took another little device called a magnetometer. A magnetometer is a device that looks like, kind of like a submarine that gets dragged behind a ship. And it has these little wing looking things on there. And it gets dragged behind a boat, and it goes right down along towards the bottom of the ocean. And they drag it all the way across. <clears throat> well, what a magnetometer does is it actually can detect the positive and the negative fields that are in the bottom of the ocean. And they were curious about it. It's kind of like when you take two magnets. If you have two magnets, put two positives together, and what happens? 
they repel each other. And if you take a negative and a positive and put them together, they will attract. attract. Well, this magnetometer is a lot like that. It's super sensitive and it can detect whether something is positive or negative, a lot like a magnet does. So if we were to take a magnet across here, you'd be able to tell it was, it was either repelling or it was attracting. And what they found out is as they went across the bottom of this ocean, that there were these really crazy marks. So they found out that right here was positive. And right here had a negative and a positive, and maybe a negative and a negative and a positive and a negative. But then as they went across, they continued to find that this had a positive, this had a negative and a negative, and a positive and a negative, and a positive and a negative, and a negative over there. Well, that might not seem like a really big deal, but it was. Because if you look at this picture, it's almost like you could fold it right in half. And everything on this side and this side is a mirror image. Even the magnetic positives and negative. So we have negative here, but positive, negative, negative, positive, negative, positive, and negative. So not only is the rock the same age, not only is the thickness the same, but also the magnetic field is exactly the same as well. So what in the world is going on here? What is happening? What's causing all of this to take place? Well, so they started doing a little bit more research and come to find out everything here leads to one little thing. It leads to Alfred Wegener's continental drift. Remember Alfred Wegener couldn't find any evidence to show how it happens? And all he had was what we call quantitative uh, information, or qualitative information. Qualitative just means that all he was able to see were the qualities. Oh, well, it looks like the puzzle, this whole earth is a big puzzle, and you can put it back together. It looks like these fossils here, they match. It looks like these rock types, they match. It looks like this continent once had a different climate than what it does currently right now. But he had no numbers with it. It was just mostly like, hey, this is what it looks like. But then, later on, scientists came up with what we call quantitative analysis, which means that it has numbers to it. So now we can actually measure some things. We were able to measure the age of the rock. We were able to measure the age of the, or the thickness of the sediment. We were able to measure the uh, magnetic field in the bottom of the ocean. So let's go through each one of these and talk about what in the world is happening here. So the first thing we talk about was the age of the rock. The one thing you need to understand about a rock is that when it comes out of the ground and it is lava, okay, and it solidifies and turns to a solid rock, it starts to age. We can actually start aging the rock by how it uh, by its radioactive decay. It will just start decaying and it decays at a certain rate. So we're able to take the age of these rocks and try to find out what in the world is going on with them. Well, if I have a rock that's here and a rock that's here and they are both the same age, it only means one thing, that they had to have been formed at the exact same time, if they're the same age. And if these rocks right here and here are the same age and the same and the same and the same and the same, then maybe we know that there's volcanic activity here in the middle. Maybe Wegener wasn't too crazy. Maybe the sea floor is actually spreading apart and the new lava that came out right here split and went in one direction and went the other direction and the rocks aged as they move along. New rocks were forming. But that wasn't really enough evidence. However, though, the sediment thickness is more evidence that actually shows that maybe the seafloor is spreading. So we've had some snow lately, right? 
Yeah, what if you heard on the news tonight that we're getting a big storm tomorrow and it is going to snow uh, one inch every five minutes? That's a lot. That's a lot of snow, right? That's a ton of snow. And uh, so the school gets shut down. Yay, right? Yeah, probably. That will never happen. Not here in Utah. No way. Okay. So, you decide, well, they didn't shut the school down, but I'm just going to stay home because it's a snow day for me. You want to actually see if this is really true. So you listen, and what did they say it was going to be? One inch every five minutes. So here you are in your home. You're sitting in your house, and you open the window, and you're looking at all the snow because you don't want to get out in the snow. And you have this ruler, this great big long ruler, and it's a yardstick. And you're like, hey, I wonder if he's really right. So you stick this yardstick out the window one foot. Bring it out one foot. And you wait five minutes. So here it is. This is the yardstick, one foot. And you wait five minutes. You bring it back in, and you measure the snow on the surface of this. And sure enough, it's one inch. It's like, hey, wow, he was right. So you thought, well, I'm going to do it again. So you stick it out just a little bit farther, another foot. Meanwhile, the snow was still on there from the original five minutes, and you wait another five minutes. Yep, so now it's out two feet. So the snow that was originally on there is now out here, and the snow is falling down, and it layers it with another inch. So now the new part right here has one inch, and this part now has another inch. He thought, let me do it one more time, because I've got a yardstick, I can set it out one more time. So you do it one more time, and so the farthest portion out here now has how many inches? It's got two inches. Because you only did it twice. So now you stick it out the additional foot, you wait five minutes, and now what? You've got an inch here, now you have an inch here, and now you have three on the end. Like, wow, that's pretty cool. It's actually correct. And now you're thinking, like, oh man, I gotta get out and shovel the sidewalks. How about shoveling that? Otherwise, we're gonna get piled in. All right, so the reason why I bring this up is because this has a lot to do with the sediment thickness. What do you notice about the thickness over here? It's thick. And over here, it's really thin. Well, if everything falls at a constant rate, like the snow was, how did we get three inches here and only one inch over here? You only stuck one foot out. Okay, we had to move the ruler out this way, one foot at a time. And this one that was out, the first part, gained another inch as this one was gaining an inch on the new unsnowed on part. And as it kept doing that, this kept accumulating more inches, this kept accumulating, and so it ends up getting thicker out here and thinner out here. The same is true for the bottom of the ocean. Why is it thicker out here and thinner out there? Well, there's only one answer to that. That the ocean floor is moving out this way and moving out this way. Not only is the rock really old here and it starts out young here and as it move out this way it would get older, but if the sediment fell at a constant rate then that means I would have, just like the ruler, one inch here, but as it moved across what would happen to the sediment? It would get thicker and thicker and thicker. Which means at one time the sediment here used to be like this over here but over time, as the bottom of the ocean has moved away from that point, the sediment has accumulated and it's gotten thicker, just like the snow did on the ruler. Do you think that was enough evidence? Probably. Pretty good, but we can actually get even more. 
So let's go back to the magnetic field. This is actually really pretty cool. Inside the Earth, we have this magnetic field. So the core, way down here, the inner core, is roughly the size of the moon. What? Yep. And then the outer core is roughly the size of Mars. Mars is half the size of Earth. Kind of tells you how big the outer core is. The inner core here is solid. It's iron. The outer core is liquid. It has some nickel and it has some iron in it. What happens is, is that nickel and iron, because it's a fluid or a liquid, it can move around. And as it moves around, it creates a magnetic field. And we get this nice big magnetic field that goes all the way around the globe. And it protects us from a lot of bad things. It's where the aurora borealis comes into play. But the cool thing about it is, is when we look at lava and magma, they have minerals in there that are magnetic. So, if the Earth is sitting like this, and we have a positive and a negative here, then let's just say that these two markers are a lot like the minerals that are in that magma. They're going to line themselves up, positive and negative, just like on a compass. So they line themselves up, positive and negative, and when they come out of the Earth, that lava is going to solidify and turn solid. And guess what happens to these minerals? Will they move? No. As long as they're in the fluid, they can move around like in a compass. But if you were to freeze the fluid in a compass, would the needle move? No. It would be permanently frozen. Well, the same is true for inside the Earth. When lava is in there and those minerals can move around, when it is pliable and movable, they will move around. But when it comes out to the surface and they turn hard or they freeze, those minerals are frozen permanently. And they are frozen in a north-south direction. But why in the world would there be a positive and a negative going across the sea floor? Remember how there was a positive and a negative and a positive and a negative? How do you get positive and negatives? Positive means that the minerals are aligned like this. Negative would mean what? They would have to be pointing down. Well, how does that happen? There's a real cool thing. Inside the core, it flips about every 200,000 years. So there'll come a time when our positive north will become negative and our south will become positive. Yeah, and it's actually frozen in the rock layer. We can see every time that this has happened in our time of the Earth, we can actually see where it's flipped. There'll come a time when all of the compasses will work backwards. They won't work correctly. Anything that uses a compass won't work correctly. It'll tell you to go north, but you'll really be going south. And you'll be going south, but you'll really be going north if you follow the compass. That's because inside the core, that magnetic polarity reverses and flips around. And it shows up in the rock. Well, the interesting thing is, is if I have a positive here and a positive here, and they're both in the same direction, that means that pointing that way, pointing that way, negative. How can I have two negatives together? Doesn't that mean both arrows are pointing down? Not necessarily, you're right. They will be pointing down, but they may be pointing more towards the side. And the thing about that one, it's pointing in the same direction. That one might be pointing back up, but this one may be pointing in that direction, and this one pointing in that direction, that one's pointing straight down, and that one's pointing straight down. So the orientation, we can actually look at the orientation, 
and know that they are a perfect match, which means that they had to have been a, in that position as a liquid at the exact same time and froze at the exact same time to get them to be identical to each other. All of this evidence suggests one thing. What do you think? No, 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 no. What's going on at the bottom of the ocean? All right. There's a little thing called seafloor spreading. So evidence found. Number one was age of the rock. Two, sediment thickness. And three, call it magnetic reversals. If you add all of that up, it all points to one thing. The sea floor is doing what? It's spreading. Points to the sea floor spreading, which means that the middle of the ocean is splitting in half and the continents are moving away. All of a sudden, now we have all of this quantitative That's a good question. Why wouldn't it split? No, no, no. Why would it, the thing split? Like the, the magnetic reversals? Yeah. Why would it split? Well, why can I flip this magnetic, or this magnet around? OK. But if I was put it in a liquid, would it still be able to flip? So the thing you need to realize is that the center of the Earth has a solid iron core. And it sits and floats inside of a fluid. And so the core spins one direction. The fluid actually spins the opposite direction. And between those two, we get a magnetic field that occurs. What would happen if that, do you think that, that core spins the exact same direction all the time? Or is it possible it could slightly shift? Okay. Once it does start to shift, the magnetic fields will turn too. Do you know that they move all the time? Our magnetic fields move all the time. If you ever look at a map, a top topographical map, you actually really need to look at the bottom of a map. And this is why you always have to have a, your most current map, because the magnetic fields change. Down the bottom of the corner of the map, it will actually give you a declination. Declination means you have to turn your compass x amount of degrees according to the magnetic field because the magnetic field always changes. So you maybe have to move, like here in Utah, I think it's like 13 degrees. We have to move our compass actually 13 degrees from north, and then your compass will actually point to north. So it's always moving all the time. It never stays put. All this evidence, guys, shows that the seafloor is moving, which is quantitative, which tells us Wegener, when we add his stuff, which was qualitative, and we add the two together, that's some pretty hard evidence that the Earth is actually moving. So now, the big question that we have to have is, why? What's going on? We actually have a pretty good idea, and that's what we'll talk about next.